Good morning, everybody. Krikos, do you want to uh, unmute and start talking? Good morning. Start your video. <laughs> there we go. So, good morning. Okay, I would like to welcome you to the the first webinar of the series organized by the Hellenic Air Force Academy Engineering Alumni Group. Uh, my name is Kyriakos Kourousis. Uh, safety has been always a popular uh, topic among engineers. So uh, when we designed this uh, webinar series, we ran a survey. And uh, this obviously came up very high in the list of uh, preferences from the, from the group and from the people who would like to hear more about this uh, topic. Um, I would like to personally thank uh, Mr. Simon Whiteley for uh, delivering, for preparing and delivering this uh, webinar today. Uh, so remember, this is a thing we do uh, under a, a voluntary capacity. Simon was very kind to offer that for, uh, for the group and uh, I hope uh, this will be very interesting for uh, those who are going to attend this. So Simon is a very experienced safety professional, having worked on various projects across different industries. And I expect uh, this webinar to be very interesting for me as well and for those who have uh, registered to attend. So uh, Simon, the floor, the virtual floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, cast accident analysis, uh, essentially investigating beyond Swiss cheese and dominoes. Um, I'm presuming you can already hear me, but if you can't, if you'd like to, uh, let's uh, let's see if you can all hear me and all your audio is working. So if you want to either type in the chat box in the questions and answers box, whether you can hear me or press the button, it should come up on your screen. So we've got everybody saying yes so far, 100%. That's good. That's positive. <laughs> okay, that's good. Um, as I say, um, this software does have a questions and a chat box. So as we go through the presentation, if you do have any questions, please type them in the questions box um, and I'll try to get to them as I go through the presentation. Otherwise, at the end of the presentation, we can go through the questions in a Q&A session. So everybody seems to be able to hear me. So that's great. Let's, uh, let's carry on. Okay, so this webinar is being recorded. Um, so if the recording is successful, there'll be a replay available at the end. Um, I'm also going to make the slide pack available for download. So if you want to download the slide pack, we can we can organize that afterwards. Um, <clears throat> thank you to Korea Cost for sort of giving me an introduction. Um, essentially, I'm a system safety engineering consultant, and my focus really is on helping bring STAM from the uh, academia into the mainstream and helping people, particularly with uh, incident and accident investigation. Um, so the aims of this uh, presentation today, basic objectives, is to open your mind. As the saying goes, minds are like parachutes, they only work if they're open. It's to provide a very brief overview and also to inspire you and plant a seed in your mind uh, so that you might be interested in learning more and perhaps using these approaches in the work that you do. So it is something new, and I say new because it's been around for almost 20 years now, um, but it's only really in the last sort of five to seven years, excuse me, that it started to gain traction. Now, the reason why I think you should pay attention is uh, I, I firmly believe, based on my experience as a safety engineer um, over the last, at least the last 10 years, is that the current way of doing safety assessments and investigations doesn't really get to the real detail that we need to make things safer. Um, and, and I believe that this is going to Im, you know, improve the way that we do things and perhaps even become the main approach to doing safety and uh, investigations. So just a little bit of context then. Um, hands up, who's familiar with the diffusion of innovation? Just uh, press your hands up or type yes in the, uh, in the chat box, let me know. Does this, uh, does this mean anything to anybody? So this is an opportunity to practice with the software for next time. <laughs> so the diffusion of innovation is just essentially a theory of how, why, and how fast new ideas and technology spread. And so really the reason I'm showing you this is just to get, get it clear in your mind 
that the use of stamp and the cast accident analysis approach based upon it is still in the early days. So you've got a number of innovators, early adopters, particularly in aerospace and automotive that are really starting to look at these approaches and try and take advantage of them in, in the businesses that they work in. But it is still very early days. And one of my personal missions, as I mentioned, is to move it from academia into the mainstream, into practice, so that we get more and more people using it, more and more people comfortable with it, so that they can get great results, uh, prevent accidents, and ultimately save lives and, and lots of money. So <clears throat> over time, logically, the use of stamp will increase, um, and I want to help and promote that as much as possible and help people such as you to take advantage of it. Now, over the last few years, I've been doing a number of webinars, a number of training sessions, and interest and usage has increased over that time. Now, those areas that I've highlighted in red, they're the areas that have really started to sit up and take notice in the last sort of 12 months. And I've been working with a number of organizations on these particular topics, uh, mainly with regards to CAST, uh, but it's just great to see that the more traditional uh, industries as opposed to aerospace and automotive, they're starting to sit up and, and really start to take notice. Now you might be wondering, well, what is stamp? Because you've told us about cast and you've not really explained it yet, Simon, and, and you've said stamp, but you've not really told us what it is. So first I'm going to tell you what, you know, why we need it. And then I'm going to talk about stamp. So there are some challenges. Um, hands up or, you know, type in the chat box, Who's familiar with this particular accident and the relative controversy surrounding it? Yep, we've got a few people. That's good, <laughs> especially for a Sunday, Sunday morning. So this is the uh, Uber self-driving car crash uh, that killed a, a pedestrian walking her bike across the road. Now, what's interesting about this particular accident is that from a technical perspective, no failures actually occurred. The autonomous driving aspect of the vehicle behaved as it was designed. It did actually detect the pedestrian. Um, it classified the pedestrian, but it didn't actually apply the brakes. And on this particular occasion, there was a human operator on board the vehicle, um, a so-called safety driver, um, but that person um, was otherwise engaged watching, apparently watching television programs on their mobile phone. So they didn't actually see what was going until it was literally too late to prevent the collision. Now, it's really interesting in this particular case study because it's, it's a situation where no failure has technically occurred. So the traditional approach to uh, safety assessments and investigations would focus on, well, how did things fail? You know, what went wrong? Um, and why did that contribute to the accident? But this particular situation, the system behaved as designed, and that's what ultimately resulted in somebody's death. So this is a different set of challenges to what we're typically used to. And this is only getting sort of, you know, more significant over time. So we've got to think, think about the speed of technical innovation and the need to be first. Uh, complexity, you know, especially with software, and then future considerations of artificial intelligence, connectivity and interdependency and interactions. Um, importantly, human role changes. For, for, so from somebody who is a doer to a supervisor. So in the case of this self-drive car accident I mentioned a moment ago, the human operator was not the doer. They were not the driver, technically speaking. They were more of a supervisor. Then the consideration of uh, the concept of human errors and what that actually means. So we're talking more about symptoms of systematic issues and not just plain end conclusion causes. And then ultimately, this is the change in this indicates the change in the nature of accidents that we're having today. So traditionally, it was all about failures, technical failures. But nowadays, because we're pretty good at managing failures, it's more starting to look at the larger proportion of unsafe interactions or behaviors, as in this case. <clears throat> so what is STAMP then? We've got to this now. So ultimately STAMP, <laughs> the, the term STAMP is an acronym that stands for Systems, Theoretic, Accident Model, and Processes. And I, I'm highlighting and emphasizing this because there is a bit of confusion amongst uh, you know, the, the, the various groups that are trying to take a, you know, start to learn and take advantage of STAMP. And they might say, well, we're going to do a stamp analysis. And actually what they're saying 
excuse me, is not quite uh, accurate because stamp itself is just a, a label for uh, the underlying foundation, the theoretical foundation and, and an accident causality model and then some analysis processes built upon that. Now, the accident causality model, the foundation, is based on systems thinking, systems theory, and control theory concepts, and we don't have time to talk about those in detail today, and then some uh, stamp-based analysis and design processes. Now, there are currently four model-based analysis processes, but the one that we're focusing on today is called CAST Accident Analysis, which is an acronym for Causal Analysis Based on Systems Theory, um, and it is essentially an accident and event analysis. Now, you might be wondering just quickly, where do the stamp-based processes fit in the standard system engineering life cycle? So I'm just highlighting that CAST really is about the operational phase and the accident, incident, or near miss. So you would use CAST during those phases, but it doesn't stop you thinking about things more broadly across the whole system life cycle. So where does stamp originate? Well, it originates from uh, a lady, Professor Nancy Leveson, from the Massachusetts of Institute of Technology in the US, MIT. And she wrote about it in various papers, but uh, more formalized it in her second book, Engineering a Safer World. Now, Nancy has very, very kindly made that uh, book available as a free PDF download. So if you go on Google and type MIT Press Engineering a Safer World, you can download a free PDF copy of that. She also kindly uh, did a webinar with me a few years ago uh, to introduce Stamp, and you can watch that on my YouTube channel uh, at the link below. Now let's talk about the theory very quickly. So I mentioned accident causality model and that that's a foundation of the CAST accident analysis approach. Now you might say, well, what is, a CAST, what is an accident causality model? Well, essentially I'm talking about a model, a belief or paradigm about how things happen or could happen, causality. And it underpins efforts to think about, discuss, manage engineers for safety, but also how to do investigations and how to structure them. Now, these are not often explicit or documented. Everyone ultimately has one embedded in their thinking, whether they realize it or not. And this forms one of your many mental models. Now, I've also highlighted that I use square brackets quite a lot during this presentation. And the reason I'm doing that is because there is a lot of English words, or English terms, labels that we use all the time but I'm just highlighting here that I'm being very specific about a specific definition or concept that is uh, shown by that label. So hands up who's familiar with the domino model by uh, Herbert Heinrich from the 1950s. Right, there's a few people there. Yeah, everyone's going for it. Brilliant, excellent. Um, so I won't go into too much detail of this, but it, it, it's predicated on the concept of what's called linear direct causality. So in this case, from left to right, uh, if there's a, an issue with social environment or the fault of the individual, that can propagate on, knock all the dominoes down, and it results in an accident. And the ultimate way to prevent an accident in this approach is to remove the dominoes uh, to prevent the escalation of the, of the dangerous event. Hands up who's familiar with the Swiss cheese model. Everyone should be going crazy at this moment. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> okay, so this is, this, is pretend, this is essentially the same. So uh, from cause to effect, linear direct causality, one thing leads to another. But in this case, we're thinking about hazards and protecting our people and assets from potential losses. And we do that uh, fundamentally by adding defenses in depth or layers of protection. But we recognize that the reality of those layers of protection is that they will have some gaps, there will be some holes. And the concern we have uh, is that those holes line up and ultimately an accident results. So the principle is, is have as many layers of protection or de defenses in depth as possible, try and avoid some of the holes do audits and check to make sure that there either are no holes or that you've you know, filled them in. And again, the predication is that you'll be safe if you manage the holes and the defences in depth. Then we've got the bow tie. So hands up who's familiar with the bow tie approach. Excellent. Yes, everybody, brilliant. So same sort of thing, linear direct causality, cause to effect, put some barriers in the way and everything should be fine. Now this is where the stamp-based approach is different. So. Uh, the traditional view of Swiss cheese dominoes and bow ties are that, is that accidents are due to chains of directly related events 
or due to breach barriers. And it defines safety as a management of failures problem. And essentially to prevent accidents, you do it by uh, preventing failures. Now, as we said before, those challenges earlier on, we're having accidents that are not due to failures, not due to breach barriers. So how do we deal with that? And this is where the stamp uh, based approach comes in, uh, the, the realm of control loops and structures. So this predicates that accidents are involve complex dynamic processes and it redefines safety as a dynamic control problem. And we essentially prevent accidents by enforcing constraints on system behavior and interactions among system components using a control structure. Now I've used loads of, loads of words there, loads of technical terms, but essentially what it means is we use, use something, a concept called a control structure to prevent accidents. So I'm going to talk quickly about uh, a control structure. So um, you'll all be familiar with this particular accident, I'm sure. So this is uh, a, uh, the Tenerife disaster from 1977. And all I've done is highlighted the control structure associated with this. So we've got two aircraft under the control of an air traffic controller, and they are providing instructions via the radio, um, and they're obviously doing it in fog, so they can't actually see each other on the airfield. And unfortunately, that uh, inadequate coordination and communication contributed to the two aircraft uh, colliding with each other in fog. Then there's the concept of control loops. So these are essentially loops within that control structure that enforce what are called safety constraints or safety requirements. So we've got a concept of uh, what are called contributory control actions. So one of the controllers in that structure uh, issues control actions to the process or layer that's under its control and it essentially essentially if those control actions are not provided provided um, at the wrong time in the wrong sequence or with the wrong duration that can cause uh, an accident or not enforce safety constraints and essentially what we do is we walk around that control loop when we're trying to understand what's caused those control actions to identify the reasons why that particular um, safety constraint was not enforced. So I'm going through this at quite a rate because I want to make sure we get to get as much uh, as we can in the case study. But each of those control loops are arranged in what's called a hierarchical control structure. And each of those layers enforce constraints on the layers below through control actions and feedback. Now thinking in terms of control structures, it helps to organize your thinking and understanding about a system, about an accident, and it provides a natural path for you to follow and a structure to work to. And this is really what makes the stamp-based analysis so powerful. So in this case, I'm just highlighting very generically uh, an aircraft trajectory under the control of an aircraft. So this is the typical technical system of interest. Uh, where we focus on failures particularly. We've got some air crew, we've got the radio communications, air traffic controller, and then above that conceptually we've got airport ATC management, airline operator, and then conceptually above that design, operations, maintenance, emergency response. And if you want to go even further, we can start looking at governmental control, legal control, and the regulatory structure. <clears throat> Excuse me. But of course, the world famous George E.P. Box, the world famous statistician, he said that once that all models were wrong, but some are useful. But he also said that we need to remember that all models are wrong. The practical question is how wrong do they have to be to not be useful? And so all I'm really highlighting here is that the stamp-based approaches are model-based approaches. So you create a control structure model of your system to try and understand what happened, um, but obviously the detail of that model uh, depends on the things that you can find. So let's talk about investigating beyond Swiss cheese and dominoes then. So CAST Accidents Analysis Overview. So CAST, as I've said, is uh, an acronym for Causal Analysis Based on Systems Theory. Uh, depending on what literature you read, it might also be Causal Analysis Based on Stamp. You can choose whichever you want to refer to. But essentially CAST is used as part of an accident or investigation process. So this is a very high level process for accident investigation. First you observe, then you document the facts, and then you plan how are we going to execute this investigation to get the maximum learning we can from it. And as part of the investigation, you'll establish some facts, you'll do some analysis, you'll generate some findings, some conclusions, and then you'll make some recommendations. Now, cast accident analysis 
fits in the analysis phase. So when somebody says, I'm going to do a cast accident analysis, they're not talking about the whole investigation process. They're just talking about analyzing the facts of the matter. Now, it's important to understand that one of the key principles of any safety investigation in principle is that uh, if we look to assign blame, that's not the same as working to understand what happened, why, and what needs to change. And that's a fundamentally different investigation goal. So from the, con from the context of CAST, the ultimate goal of CAST is to understand what was the control structure that existed to enforce the high level safety constraints, and then how and why each level of that control structure allowed or contributed to inadequate control at that level. Now this is, as I said, this is not just focusing on failures or what went wrong, but we include that, but also what went right and how that contributed. So you might be having inklings of safety one and safety two and safety differently. So this covers both sides of that, uh, that coin. And then make re recommendations and suggestions, you know, what changes to the control structure are necessary so that high level safety constraints can be enforced recognizing that in some cases they might not be able to be enforced. So if you were to say, Simon, what is cast accident analysis? What does the process look like? Please show me. So this is literally the cast process on one page. So we define some losses. We define the hazards that contribute to those losses. We define the high level safety constraints, which are intended to uh, control those hazards or prevent those hazards and losses. Then we do some modeling. So if we're doing an investigation, we'll create a timeline, we'll create a control structure model, and then we analyze that model. And the analysis is in three parts, but it's not sort of sequential. It is iterative as you start to learn more about the different parts of the control structure. But you first think about the physical process, the control structure components, and the control structure structure itself. And then we make recommendations and then follow through with implementation. Now, we, we haven't got much time today, so we're only going to briefly talk about modeling, and then we're going to talk about the control structure uh, component and structure analysis. So, mid-air collision, Überlingen, Germany, July 2002. Hands up, who's familiar with this one? And depending on how familiar you are, I won't need to explain all the details. Okay, so there's a couple of people. Has everyone else gone to sleep? <laughs> Okay, there's a few. Well, what I'll do is I'll give a very brief overview of this then. So essentially in uh, July 2002, about half past nine in the evening, so a dark night, uh, there were two aircraft operating in German and Swiss airspace or in German airspace in this case. And they essentially collided with each other uh, in midair, um, resulting in deaths of everybody, damage, destruction on the ground and all that kind of, kind of stuff. Now, essentially, uh, so this is the timeline. So from 21.21 in the evening through to the collision at 21.35. So over the space of 10 minutes, 15 minutes, everything was fine. Two perfectly working aircraft uh, ended up in a, a collision midair. So these are the two aircraft. There's a Boeing 757 uh, for um, DHL and a Tupolev TU-154 for Bashkirin Airlines. So the TU-154, they noticed that there was a TCAS indication, which is Traffic Collision and Avoidance System. So they saw the other aircraft. And then a few moments later, a minute or so later, there was a TCAS Traffic, uh, traffic Alert Advisory, which essentially makes them aware that there's traffic in the area. And then it's at this point, very quickly afterwards, that the ATC radar controller instructs the crew to descend. The crew starts the descent. And then a few moments later, the TCAS then uh, issues what's called a resolution advisory to both crews at the same time. So the DHL crew was told to descend, bearing in mind the Tupolev was already told to descend by the air traffic controller. The TCAS then issued a different resolution advisory to climb, uh, which is contrary to what the air traffic controller provided. The radar controller, the ATC, then repeats the instruction to descend um, because it wasn't acknowledged in the first case. And then essentially both aircraft descended into each other and collided. Now the two hazards involved in this are loss of safe separation and conflict in trajectories. The two safety constraints associated with this are that the control structure, not just the pilots, not just the aircraft, not just the air traffic controller, but the whole system 
shall prevent the loss of safe separation and also prevent conflict in trajectories that lead to loss of safe separation. Now, if we start looking at the control structure, let's model the control structure. So we've got the trajectory of two aircraft. We've got the two aircraft under the control of their respective crews. We've got the TCAS. Then we've got the radio channel, the radio communications frequency. We've got a sector radar picture. And then we've got the air traffic controller. Now, I just want to highlight here that both of these aircraft were on the same radio channel. And the air traffic controller, the reason I've shown a red arrow is just to highlight that the air traffic controller provided a descent command to the Bashkirian crew very, very shortly before the TCAS resolution advisories that were issued. So there is a conflict between the actions, that the control actions that have been provided, but there's no way for the air traffic controller to know this because there was no response to the air traffic controller. So let's do the analysis of this control structure model. Let's focus on the structure and the components. So as part of cast accident analysis of the control structure model, once you've done it, there's two phases really, component analysis and structure analysis. So the component analysis looks at the individual components in the control structure, and then the structure analysis looks at the, the bigger picture. And it allows you to think about work as imagined versus, ver excuse me, versus work as done, which is, you're probably familiar with those concepts. So in this case, from a component analysis perspective, and this is very brief, we can think about the Bashkirian crew. You know, what were their safety related responsibilities? Well, one of them is to follow, uh, to fly the aircraft safely, you know, avoid conflicts, avoid collisions, uh, follow the rules that are set by their airline and by their, their governments, um, and also do what the air traffic controller tells them. So as far as they're concerned, from their perspective, when they, descended the aircraft they were doing the right thing they were doing what they were told but what's interesting is from their mental model perspective their process model they were following what the air traffic controller was told to do but they were also following what their national uh, requirements and operations manuals say which is to do whatever the air traffic controller says basically now that's in conflict to the dhl crew so they have the same roles and responsibilities but their mental model, their training, said that they should, no matter what happens, follow what the TCAS does. And so that is one of the challenges with the behavior. They were both doing exactly what they were supposed to do. They technically not failed in what they did because they followed procedures, but unfortunately that resulted in a, a mid-air collision. Then we can start talking about the structure analysis. So in this case, um, there are sort of six broad elements that you look at as part of the accident analysis. But in this particular one, the interesting thing is communication and coordination. So you can see that the communication across the control structure was not exactly coordinated, and it was also challenging from a timing perspective. There was no way for the air traffic controller to know that the TCAS had provided contrary instructions. So let's talk about the structure analysis very briefly then. So this is a, a, the ATC workstations in the air traffic control center in Zurich. Um, these two represent two different workstations. So on the left-hand side, you've got one air traffic controller for the RP section, the radar planning. And then on the right-hand side, you've got the radar executive workstation. So all I've done is added more detail to the control structure model so I can understand, well, why did the air traffic controller behave the way that they did on the day? Now, you'll notice that this is, you know, there's a few dotted lines and different colors. The only reason I've done that is just to show and talk about different things. But the thing that's really important to highlight is that this is how it's supposed to be, work as imagined, but this is how it actually was, work as done. So there was only one air traffic controller in charge of two sectors, and they had to basically swing on their chair between these two sectors to talk to these two different parts of the airspace. And that contributed to them not understanding that there was a potential conflict between these two aircraft and then acting appropriately in time. Now, if you want to go really far, as I mentioned earlier on in your investigation, you can start to move outwards and upwards of the control structure and look at more and more things. So you might not be aware, but on this particular uh, night, the technical management of the air traffic control system, so the computers, the telephones, the radios, all of that good stuff, they were actually doing some technical changes over a six hour plan. And they'd agreed to do it at night because that's the quietest time to do it. 
but this wasn't adequately communicated to the actual air traffic controllers so they didn't know that some of their equipment was not working correctly okay so findings then very quickly so in the official report there were two immediate causes recognized an imminent separation infringement which was not noticed by atc in time and then the tu 154 crew following the atc instructions to descend and even continued to do so after the TCAS advised them not to. So they're the two immediate causes. Three systemic causes, so the integration of the TCAS into the aviation system was inadequate. So that was where the DHL crew had different understanding of what they required versus the Russian crew. Regulation standards, procedures and training were not standardised. Air Navigation Service Provider did not ensure that all the workstations were continuously staffed and that they tolerated that for many years. So just, just, just on those sort of five causes from the original investigation, has it sort of dawned on you that the stuff we talked about in the space of five minutes has highlighted that there are actually many more causes of this particular accident than just these five basic ones that have been identified? So just some final thoughts then. So an accident, incident or near miss essentially reveals that the control structure is inadequate in some shape or form. And essentially it's highlighting that that's a massive learning opportunity. And that obviously near misses and incidents are cheap and valuable learning opportunities because people are willing to speak and give information freely. But it's also important to remember if you do do those kind of things, if people do report near misses, it's important to provide feedback to those people um, when they report. So just some reflections and questions then. So how can you see this approach helping you in what you do? You know, what benefits can you see based on this very short presentation? And what challenges can you see? What other questions and comments are you having in your mind right now? We'll talk about those in, in a little while. So just from further information, some events. So uh, if you want to get a copy of uh, Nancy Leveson's book, you can do that there. She also has a website, uh, which you, the MIT Partnership for Systems Approach to Safety, and then her own website, sunnyday.mit.edu. So if you want to learn more about STAMP, I highly recommend going and looking at those things. If you'd like to, if you'd like to read the official CAST handbook, so how to learn more from incidents and accidents, you can get that from uh, Nancy's website. Um, it is free. Download that. Highly recommend it. There are some upcoming live events. So there's the MIT Stamp Workshop in March in the US, Boston. I've already booked my tickets, so I'll be there. So if you'd like to come and say hello. Uh, in October next year, um, I'm hosting the European Stamp Workshop in partnership with the Warwick Manufacturing Group. So if you'd like to come to the UK um, and learn more about stamp accidents, uh, stamp, cast, and all the other approaches, then you're most welcome to. Um, and then, <clears throat> Yeah, so this is a picture from the recent uh, European Stamp Workshop in Helsinki. So myself and Sid Arthur, we will be hosting that uh, in Coventry uh, in the UK. And then, of course, webinars, slide packs and videos from my previous presentations. You're welcome to go to my website and download loads of free slide packs. And also, if you'd like to subscribe to my YouTube channel, that would be awesome. Um, I am also running a Cast Accident Analysis Essentials for Pro Professionals course next year. So if you're interested in that, you're welcome to send me an email and we can have a conversation. I mean, that's essentially it. So uh, if you've got any questions and you'd like some answers, please, uh, please ask some questions. So we've got a couple of questions already. Here we go. So uh, Nikos says, how could artificial intelligence be used in this process? for safety optimization? That's actually a great question. Um, I can't really say too much about artificial intelligence because uh, I'm not in, in that field, uh, well, not yet, not in any detail. Um, but I think we'd have to talk about what concept of artificial intelligence you're talking about. I suppose it could, you know, some form of machine learning and intelligence could be used to select appropriate evidence or arrange information and data um, perhaps uh, generate the control structure model. That would be quite an interesting thing. I mean, do you have some ideas, Nikos? Do you want to? Oh, do you want to maybe talk a bit more about that in the comments? Or are there only any other any other questions? 
or has everybody been so blown away by the presentation that they've got no questions and they know everything there is to know and that you're all going to go away and do some cast accident analysis and tell us how you did. I'm presuming the system is working. Something's happening. Oh, there's some chat box. There we go. Here we go. What kind of software do you suggest for cast analysis? So uh, that's from uh, Kare Kos. Yeah, excellent. Okay, that's a good question. So um, at the moment, there is very limited software tool support for these kind of uh, analyses. Um, but I personally use um, some software on the iPad uh, Pro uh, called Liquid Text, which allows me to analyze information, extract information, and draw control structure models. Um, and then I formalize those uh, using the Microsoft Physio drawing tool. Um, Nikhil asks, where does the safety culture fit in the control feedback loop? Okay, let me go back to this picture. So can everyone see this okay? Because obviously it's quite small and there's a lot, of, a lot of information on this page. And if you are looking on your mobile phone squinting, uh, you might not be able to see it in detail. But essentially safety culture is a, an emergent property of the system. And in my, from my perspective, it applies both individually. So what safety culture does an individual have? Uh, you know, the thoughts that they have, the beliefs that they have, and the behaviors that they have. But also, how does that propagate with their interactions with other people? Bearing in mind, in this case, we've got a community of air traffic controllers. We've got a community of pilots and flight crew. We've got the management. And then we've got the technical management. So. Um, in this particular case, uh, we spoke about the fact that the operations management of this air traffic control center, they tolerated, were aware of and tolerated uh, the, excuse me, the behavior of having one air traffic controller instead of two air traffic controllers, and that they tolerated it for years. And this was not in accordance with their procedures technically, as I understand it. Um, and so there are questions there in terms of going and asking, well, you know, this is the control structure as it is. Those controllers in the higher part of the hierarchy, why did they behave that way? What was their mental model? What were their control algorithms? Um, okay, so there's a, another question. So I recently attended the Cesar event in Athens so thought that somehow neural networks could assist with ATC. Um, I think the automation and artificial intelligence could help with ATC in a number of places, but I'm not, um, I'm not involved directly with that stuff, so I can't really say what the state of the art is. Um, so yes, it, it could help. James, hi James. Um, how do you prioritize controls that failed seeing that using CAST can give so many? That is a great question. So essentially you identify the, the causes, the causal scenarios, and then you identify the safety constraints that were, were not enforced. And you prioritize them based on how, uh, how significant those control actions are, those safety constraints are. So in the case of the court, which page is it? Uh, this page. So in the case of prioritizing the actions uh, of aircrew based on TCAS or air traffic control instructions, the recommendation, the immediate recommendation and the immediate action is that all aircrew are, you know, basically reprogrammed <laughs> for want of a better term. They are essentially to ensure that they follow the TCAS under all conditions. And the air traffic controllers are also given appropriate support so that they recognize that when they're communicating with crews, there is a potential that the TCAS has given them conflict and instructions and to expect what might appear to be odd behaviors. Now, there is also a, a implied recommendation there that the mental model, the process model of the air traffic controller has to be updated in some way so that they know independently of the air crew that the TCAS has issued a collision, of a, a collision resolution advisory. So you'll notice just this very high level picture, 
the air traffic controller has information about the trajectories based on flight strips and then it has information about the location of those aircraft and their trajectories based on a sector radar picture but there is no technical feedback loop that informs the air traffic controllers about TCAS and whether TCAS has gone off but also what TCAS has actually commanded and that is something as a recommendation that, that could be made based on this assessment but obviously that mitigation is you know going to include some level of cost and technical change um, so there has to be considerations of prioritization but ultimately to prevent this kind of accident occurring again there has to be changes to the structure and the behavior of the components within it so are there any other questions we need time to digest it yes absolutely there's a lot there to think about <laughs> thanks nectarios are there any other questions uh let's oh hang on there's some here uh, so Nikhil, how does the industry respond to introducing stamp in their organizations trade-offs that's a great question as i mentioned very uh, at the very beginning it is early days for introducing stamp into organizations because ultimately you know with any change people are reluctant you know especially if they've not had any accidents or anything serious happening you know there's no real motivation for them to look at something new and try try something new but also because stamp because of the different underlying accident causality model which just on this one page the industry is already in this traditional view this traditional mindset and so to get them to start to use stamp and think about stamp there is a there is a period of time of education and awareness that needs to happen and that's ultimately what I'm trying to do with my webinars and the, the trainings that I do. So ultimately, it's about helping them understand the opportunity, as I'm hoping you can see from today, and then helping them in that learning and then practice and then implementation. So there are, there are organizations doing it, as I mentioned on, where is it, this slide. So all the green ones, green bold, they're the um, industrial areas that have really sort of embraced it and they've been the first out of the block. And then there are the others, more recently, the red ones that I've highlighted that have started to take it more seriously. So oil and gas, petrochemical, healthcare, medical devices, uh, energy, and then space systems and particularly orbital safety. Because in that case, you've got a huge control structure with people building, designing and building uh, space vehicles launchers launch facilities and then you've got various different operators then you've also got the complexities of the traditional space programs which were typically military or governmental and then more into commercial space and how you coordinate between the two right what other questions have we got everyone's getting a bit lively now <laughs> um, what kind of feedback you have from its implementation so far so all the feedback I've had uh, in terms of um, industries that are safety critical, it's been very, very positive. Um, so I've been invited to do some training for some airlines, which I've completed recently, um, and also training with oil and gas, um, uh, petrochemical, chemical facilities and oil and gas platforms, and then also medical devices and healthcare operations, so radiation oncology. Um, so everybody seems... To, uh, it's interesting because there are a number of industries and a number of groups of people that know there's a problem with the way they do things currently and it just doesn't really get them to where they think they need to be and then there, there are those that are on the journey of learning about it and you know reaching out and learning you know doing training and reading and learning about this stuff but it's all sort of small steps at the moment um, but I am aware that there are some automotive and some aerospace companies that are really you know getting stuck in particularly with the the stpa hazard analysis process which is not something i've spoken about today but they've started to use that as part of their prime uh, design process because they can get some really great results very very early so one of the slides that i talked around very quickly is this one so whilst cast is focused primarily on the operations phase the underlying principles can be applied during very early concept design so using a process called stecker 
um, and then also through the whole design life cycle using STPA. And that includes changes to operations. So you can use the STPA approach, uh, systems theoretic process analysis. So all the feedback I've had is positive, but obviously with any you know, fundamental mindset shift, there is always going to be some challenges and some potential resistance. But on the whole, most of the people I've spoken to, because they're in this early pioneer stage down here, they're already looking for another solution. They're already looking for competitive advantage. So they're a lot easier to work with. Um, and I've been focusing on supporting them as opposed to trying to change the mainstream. Because in civil aerospace, for example, you've already got a, a safety process that has apparently worked for 30 years and we've not had many accidents and that should be recognized. Uh, but with the recent uh, Boeing 737 MAX accidents that have occurred, um, that's showing that something's not right and the current approach is not adequate, shall we say. More questions, any other questions? Let's have a look. Um, uh, Nikhil, how does the industry respond to introducing stamp in their organizations? Yeah, we talked a little bit about that. At the moment, it's still early days, um, but I, I'm aware that a particular Japanese automotive manufacturer, um, they tried it out, tested it themselves. Um, and then when I saw them the year later, they'd introduced it and rolled it out into their standard process, which is, you know, it's incredible, but also not unexpected because the Japanese are, you know, famous for being innovators. Uh, so any, even if it's a small percentage advantage, they will attempt it and get that advantage. So yeah, are there any more questions? Or is everybody happy that they've got their fill of cast accident analysis and stamp today? Okay, everyone's gone quiet. Is it still working? There we go. <laughs> um, Cryocost, would you like to come back on camera and unmute talk? Yes. There we go. Hello. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> it was very interesting. I think uh, yeah, th there are a lot of questions more <laughs> to, to come, but uh, the, the time is limited as always. So thank you again for uh, the presentation. Uh, You're most welcome. Uh, yeah, I, I presume this will be uploaded in the in your YouTube channel, which is going to be shared again with, uh, uh, with the group and uh, more broadly, I would say, to, to anyone who would be interested to learn more about that. Okay, cool. So thank you again. <laughs> You're most welcome. Thank you to you and thank you to the audience because obviously it is Sunday and, yes. uh, you know, it, it's only the most, you know, rabid, interesting people that come in and, you know, really push out on a weekend. So thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. And if you do have any other questions or comments, I'm always open to have a conversation. Um, and of course, as, as the YouTubers say, remember to like, share and subscribe. <laughs> yeah. Have a nice day. Yeah, you too. Thanks very much, everybody. See you soon. Bye-bye. Okay.